Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Lewis, and I'm the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. Thank you again for joining us for today's lecture, The New History of the Old South, What the Filson's Collections Reveal About Antebellum Kentucky with Dr. Christina Snyder. Dr. Snyder is the McCabe Greer Professor of the American Civil War Era at the Pennsylvania State University. She's the author of Great Crossings, Indian Settlers and Slaves in the Age of Jackson, 2017, and Slavery in Indian Country, The Changing Face of Captivity in Early America, 2010. These books received a wide range of accolades, including the Francis Parkman Prize, the John H. Dunning Prize, the James H. Broussard Prize, and the John C. Ewers Prize. Snyder is also a former Filson Fellow. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction, Patrick. It's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm especially excited to share this research because uh, so much of it took place at the Filson. And what I wanted to do today was to speak a little bit about my most recent book and to talk about some of the specific insights um, that the Filson collections offer. Uh, particularly new ways that we can think about antebellum history. So um, I'm going to go ahead and give a little PowerPoint um, presentation that includes uh, a lot of images and also some uh, quotations that I'm using with permission uh, of the Filson. And then I'll turn it back over to uh, Patrick at the end of the presentation, and he, he will moderate the Q&A. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so here we have, um, oh, I forgot I, my, my closed captionings turn on sometimes. I've discovered this while teaching, so um, apologies for that. But um, here's my opening slide. Um, and I'm gonna move now to uh, the book slide. Um, so this shows my 2017 book that Patrick mentioned, uh, much of which uh, I researched at the Filson. Um, and yeah, I'll talk about some of the insights that I gained while researching the book. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you know, I'll be happy to answer uh, during Q&A. And the book is also um, you know, widely available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, and through Oxford University Press's website. So uh, the subject of the book and um, where it gets its title from is a place in Scott County called Great Crossings. Um, today, it's actually usually presented in the singular Great Crossing, um, although in the 19th century, people tended to pluralize it. Um, so that's why it appears that way in the book. Um, this is an image of um, Great Crossings later in the 19th century. Uh, many of you may be familiar um, with it. I'll show you a regional map in a few minutes, but it's in the bluegrass region. And it's particularly interesting because it was the home of a famous Native American boarding school called Choctaw Academy, um, and also a famous interracial family. Um, so these are the two kind of angles that I want to talk about in terms of enhancing our understanding of antebellum Kentucky, uh, that is Native American history and the history of interracial families. So uh, here's, here's a little map to get us oriented. So you'll, you'll see that um, Great Crossings is uh, quite close to um, Frankfurt, Lexington, and Georgetown. Um, it's got its name in the 18th century because it was the crossing place uh, for bison over Elkhorn Creek. Um, but in the 1800s, it became a different kind of crossing ground, a place that brought lots of diverse people together. And um, in this particular place, um, this uh, Native American boarding school, Choctaw Academy, uh, opened in 1825, and it lasted until 1848. Um, and at this place, um, there were Native Americans from 17 different tribal nations who um, eventually went to school there, over 700 boys and men. 
Um, this was only a school for boys, and I can talk more about why that is later if you guys would like. Um, but this will give you a sense of the geographic diversity of the tribal nations represented there. Um, it's called Choctaw Academy because initially it was a school for Choctaw boys and men. They are um, the original people of what is now Mississippi, and you'll see they come from the deep south. Um, they're joined by several other southern tribes. Um, and eventually tribes from throughout the Midwest and even the Great Plains. So this is an incredibly diverse place. Um, this is uh, a place where many of these native boys met for the first time. Um, and they spoke um, 16 different languages. So, you know, there's quite a bit of linguistic diversity, also cultural diversity. We're talking about um, some boys from the South uh, were actually the sons or nephews of wealthy planters. So they lived kind of a Southern planter lifestyle. Um, there were also uh, Midwestern fur traders um, and even Great Plains bison hunters. So we're talking about a place where, you know, there were native people and even the native people there were just incredibly diverse. And English was the only language that they had in common. Um, as I mentioned also, this is a place of um, interracial families. Uh, this is uh, an, an image of Imogene Johnson Pence, who's the daughter of Richard Mentor Johnson and Julia Chen. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about them at the end of the presentation. Um, really it's Richard Mentor Johnson who's bringing this very diverse community together. Uh, this is a particularly attractive picture of him from the 18 teens. You'll see that some of the later pictures are not as flattering, but this is um, one of the ones that his family likes the most. And I think it is a particularly um, vibrant um, picture uh, that comes from a locket, which was actually in Imogene's family for generations. So his daughter Imogene, who you saw in the previous slide, um, this was in her, her family for, for many generations before. Um, finally finding its home today at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So I, I bet that of those of you who are familiar with Richard Mentor Johnson, and I bet that many of you attending today are Kentuckians, and so you know something about Richard Mentor Johnson. He's probably most famous um, for two things. He was vice president under Martin Van Buren, who was a longtime politician in the Democratic Party. Um, he was quite prominent and he rose to that promise, prominence because he claimed to have killed Tecumseh at the Battle of the Thames. And I know that that's a very controversial claim. Um, it's still certainly debated today. Um, but whether you believe that or not, um, that is what most people in antebellum America believed. And it was actually what most Native Americans who were involved in the Battle of the Thames also believed. So whether it's true or not, it became a, a real political boon for Johnson and he was able to eventually ride it to the vice presidency. So how did the reported killer of Tecumseh um, become the schoolmaster for a Native American boarding school? This is a very complicated question, um, but the bottom line is that Jackson thought of himself as a kind of um, master of Indian affairs, no matter what the affairs of the day were. So when it came to, to matters of war, he considered himself an expert in that realm. And as the US um, began to develop a school system uh, for native children, he also wanted to be an expert in that realm. So he saw, I mean, Indian affairs was an incredibly important part of American foreign policy in the early 19th century. And Johnson recognized that. And he thought that this could continue to enhance his political career by having this close association with uh, Indian affairs. And in fact, he served uh, on the Indian affairs committee in the Senate for a long period of time. Um, so 
why did the U.S. want to establish Western style schools for Native American children in the early 1900s? Well, here's one quote um, from a U.S. general which encapsulates some of the basic ideas. Educating the children will go further to keep peace on our frontiers than all the armies that has been or may be sent there. So um, essentially what the US is saying is that it, the federal government believed that by educating children in Western ways that they could establish uh, allies in Indian country who might be friendly to American policy. That was the basic hope. Um, and I think this is a story that we're all probably pretty familiar with. Um, the bigger part of the question is why did, why might Native Americans um, be interested in Western style schooling? That's much more of a, a mystery um, in this historical context. And um, I should mention that one thing that uh, distinguished Choctaw Academy from later Indian boarding schools is that it is uh, nominally voluntary. So the tribes themselves are the ones who are contracting with the federal government, and they are the ones selecting the children who will attend the Choctaw Academy. Um, and um, again, that's in contrast to some of the, the schools like Carlisle that you may be familiar with that are established later in the 19th century. Um, so, so why were these native leaders interested in sending their children to American schools? Well, this is again, a really telling quote from a Potawatomi chief named Noonday. I wish our children to be instructed like the whites, then these educated children will become capable of assisting us in the transaction of business with white people. Okay, so what he's saying is like, we are increasingly surrounded by whites and we need to be able to engage with them um, at a very high level. Here are some maps that will help illustrate what Noonday is talking about. So these are really useful maps that come from the University of Texas that show not just United States claims um, in the 1800s, but where Americans had actually settled. So in 1820, which is a few years before Choctaw Academy is established, um, you see that the United States really settlement is fairly restricted to the east. You know, there's there are pockets of settlement certainly in the Trans-Appalachian West, including in Kentucky, of course. Um, but the U.S. is still largely an East Coast country. Now let's contrast that to 1850, when um, this map has really um, filled in quite a bit. Right, so, so the US population is really starting to invade lots of new areas of Indian country um, and is seeking to gain that land through treaties. And so if we go back to Noonday's quote, I mean, what he's talking about is like uh, that Indian nations don't wanna rely on white interpreters to negotiate treaties or trade agreements. They want um, highly educated members of their own tribal nations who can read the language of legal ease, right? So, so if you've ever tried to read a treaty, um, <laughs> you recognize that these are highly, um, you know, legal speak documents and that you would have to be extremely conversant in English um, and in American ways to be able to understand and negotiate those treaties. So, um, that is what brings all of these different tribal nations to central Kentucky, um, to great crossings. And in many ways, Choctaw Academy is the first um, school of its kind in the sense that um, it is actually the first um, Indian boarding school that is controlled by the federal government. Um, the only other kinds of schooling American style schooling that was available to Indian nations during this time are mission schools. And mission schools really refuse, um, I'll come back to this in just a second, but mission style schools refuse to um, distinguish um, uh, conversion from education. 
And many tribal leaders were interested in education, but not conversion. So they really wanted to separate those two missions. And one of the champions of establishing Choctaw Academy, which was a secular school, um, students were not required to go to church, um, but they could if they wanted to. And some of them did actually go to local churches, but again, it wasn't required. So Mishula Tubby, who was um, one of the three chiefs of the Choctaw Nation, he's really the most directly responsible for um, engaging in this contract with Choctaw Academy. And he saw it as an alternative to mission schools. People complained about mission schools for all kinds of reasons, um, principally the um, evangelist mission of those schools. But Mishula Tubby also thought that the education that students were receiving um, was not very good. So he, he has a lot of kind of funny quotes um, he obviously had a sense of humor. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, we could never get a scholar out of those schools that was able to keep a grog shop book. So essentially like, um, you know, these graduates um, are not even able to keep uh, accounts on uh, bootlegging businesses. So he, he's, not, he's not very impressed with the level of schooling that students are getting out of mission schools. Um, and what Choctaw Academy promised was a more elite level of education, um, more elite than what was being offered in um, mission schools at the time, something that was comparable to American schools. Um, this is a view of the Choctaw Academy site in 1929, um, where all these folks converged. This is what you see here. The building in the foreground is the main, um, or, well, I should say the first dormitory slash classroom building that was built. It's three stories. Um, the Johnson Big House is actually in the background there. So you can see just how closely it's intertwined with Johnson's personal life and home. Um, eventually there were many other buildings uh, at the Academy site, but this is the only one that survived for a long time. And it's actually still around today. Um, there's a preservation effort underway in Scott County. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A if you guys are interested in that. But what you see here essentially is this, um, it's, this is a kind of collaborative effort between the current landowner, um, Chip Richardson, uh, the Choctaw Nation, and a few other stakeholders who are working to preserve this. And again, Choctaw Academy is catering to, um, especially in its early years, more elite um, native students. So especially the, the sons or nephews of chiefs or of businessmen. So here is one of the most um, prominent graduates of the Academy, Peter Pitchlin, um, who we know quite a bit about. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about him later. This is uh, a, a, a diploma that I found from, from the Academy. Uh, this is another one of the most prominent graduates of Choctaw Academy, Robert M. Jones, and his 1830 diploma, um, which he kept with him throughout his life and is now preserved at the Oklahoma Historical Society. If you guys are interested in the history of the Civil War era, you may know that Robert M. Jones, who was a Choctaw, was um, Indian Territory's delegate to the Confederate Congress. So the schoolmaster of Choctaw Academy was a man named Thomas Henderson. This is a really fine portrait of him by another Kentucky resident, John James Audubon. Um, and it is at the Filson today. Um, Henderson is a really interesting guy, and a lot of what we know about uh, Great Crossings comes from his collection, which is at the Filson. So I think it's one of the most rich and interesting collections in all of antebellum history. And I've been working in the field for about 20 years at this point. Um, so we'll see firsthand some of his accounts of both the school and of um, interracial uh, families in Great Crossings. 
Henderson is um, like Richard Mentor Johnson's family, originally from Virginia, and he um, had more enlightened views than many people of his day. So he believed, for example, that in the education of Native Americans and African Americans. Um, and uh, he had also um, personally overseen efforts to emancipate slaves in Virginia. Um, he's also like, he, he wrote a geography textbook. So we have kind of a lot of materials about Henderson. We've got his collections, we've got his textbook. Um, we've got a decent amount of historical data about him. And he's a bit of a Renaissance man. So he's an interesting figure. He is the schoolmaster um, for almost the entire period of Choctaw Academy's existence. Now, um, delving further into, you know, why are Native people interested in pursuing education during this period? Um, they believe, um, and this school is established in the 1820s, that it can help them remain uh, in the East, that it can help them avoid uh, Indian removal. So we, we associate Indian removal with Andrew Jackson's presidency. Um, and it was a policy that was passed in 1830. But as early as 1803, Thomas Jefferson is talking about Indian removal. Um, so part of the effort toward education is intended to combat that impulse toward removal. Um, and one of the strategies that Indian nations seized on was this idea of civilization and of um, proving themselves to be civilized uh, nations that were in many ways peers to the United States. So um, what you have here is an interesting editorial from a Cherokee man who wrote into the Arkansas Gazette in 1828. And he's really addressing this question, of, you know, what is civilization? And he goes through all these different criteria. He says, you know, is it agriculture? We Cherokees have extremely productive farms. Um, is it community building? Is it um, morality and religion? You know, and, and what he's talking about here is sort of like really comparing um, Cherokee civilization to frontier whites. Um, and, and the final thing that he mentions here is, you know, is civilization um, about school and the education of youth? And his final sentence is, I believe a larger portion of our youths can read and write um, than those in your own settlements. So, you know, Indian nations at this time, many, many people, and especially the nations that chose to to send their children to Choctaw Academy, they think that um, education is a key part of civilization and that native nations were civilized peoples who deserved to remain where they were and were not a threat to the United States. Um, and it is true that um, Indian nations do develop uh, extensive public schooling systems. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Now, of course, you know, native, many native people believe this, um, but many whites who had interacted um, with these native nations also believed um, that native people were quote, civilized and did not deserve to be removed. So um, a white school mistress from Kentucky who had visited Choctaw Academy predicted that the Choctaws would soon quote, buy with the most enlightened nations on our globe. You know, so, so what they're saying here is that um, Native people had equal intellectual capacities to whites and through education could become, again, like the most enlightened nations on the globe. Um, in terms of whites, you know, that is more of a minority view. Um, and Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy does pass um, both houses of Congress in 1830, um, although it was very controversial at the time and barely passed the House of Representatives, um, it did go into effect in 1830. And so all, all of these different native nations that you see, almost all of them are the targets 
of removal. We often uh, associate it really closely with the Cherokee Nation and the Trail of Tears, but in fact, Indian removal was a blanket policy that was supposed to um, force all, all Indian nations of the East to remove West. And so you can see that these native nations that had been quite spread out before, um, they become really compressed in, into a new space that's called Indian territory. Um, and what you see is that that um, encompasses parts of what's now Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. Um, and these nations are being forced into tighter and tighter quarters. And so ultimately schooling is not able to help these nations resist uh, removal, forced removal from their homelands. But I do wanna talk a little bit about, you know, I, we, we do know quite a bit about Indian removal, but um, what is focusing on Great Crossings um, teach us that we, that we didn't know before? So um, a few things. Um, I think first it, it shows us um, the nature and, and high level of interest of Native nations in Western schooling um, in the early Republic era. And I've talked about you know, all the reasons why they were interested in schooling. Here you see some of their subjects. Um, before I wrote this book, most of what we knew about Native schools in this period were about mission schools. So um, what you see here is a different kind of curriculum that was very much in line with what American schools at the time were teaching. Some of these students became quite advanced scholars. Um, and part of the draw of sending Indian children to Choctaw Academy was actually Transylvania University, which was in nearby Lexington. And at the time, Transylvania was really regarded as the best university west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and many native leaders knew that. And so a handful of the Choctaw Academy graduates actually went to law or medical school at Transylvania University. Um, and, and some other American universities, like what eventually became Vanderbilt and what eventually became Emory and what eventually became uh, the University of Delaware. So one of the things that I found when I kind of traced out the life histories of these students was that uh, many of them attended colleges or professional schools. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because when I went through special collections at Transy, um, they didn't actually know that they had any students of color before the 1960s. So they were unaware that some of these very early students were Native American. And that's because um, race was not listed on admissions during that period. Um, so I suspect that really we are underappreciating the amount of Native American men who went to colleges and universities in the early American period. Um, this is the same guy as in the last side, slide, Joseph Barasa. He went to law school at Transy. He later becomes a lawyer in, um, among the Potawatomis uh, and he helps them negotiate treaties. Um, some of these men, this is actually a note between Peter Pitchlin, um, one of the Choctaws, uh, he, who went to um, the University of Nashville, which is now um, Vanderbilt University. And here he's writing a note to one of his friends. And so this note is partially in Latin. And what he's saying is, this is a postscript, don't apply yourself too closely. And he's talking about um, to, your, to your schoolwork, don't apply yourself too closely to your schoolwork. It may injure your health, although you must remember. And then he has this phrase in Latin, which translates to exertion breaks the bow, relaxation weakens the mind. So what he's saying here is kind of don't work too hard, don't play too hard. Um, but the bottom line about this piece of evidence is that these uh, native scholars are, you know, some of them, are reading Greek and Latin and are receiving what was at the time really a premier uh, 
um, American education. And this is the, the guy who, who wrote that note. Um, even though native nations are forced to remove in Indian territory, they, um, they do turn away from Choctaw Academy. So that's really the reason why Choctaw Academy closes in 1848 is because after the Indian removal policy is implemented, many native nations think that the United States is no longer taking its mission seriously to, to educate native children. And so what happens is that these native nations themselves start to establish um, public schooling and much more widespread print culture. So that's what you're seeing here. This is a, one of the many hundreds of books published in the Choctaw language. This is um, the first uh, female school that's established um, in Indian territory. It was originally established in the 1830s and you see it here in the 1880s. So several things happen after Choctaw Academy closes. Um, education becomes more democratized. So it becomes open to different classes of people, including girls and women um, who start to receive more of uh, co-educational opportunities starting in the 1840s. Now I wanna move back and talk about the other aspect uh, of antebellum history that I promised to address in this talk. And that is um, the history of race in antebellum Kentucky. So Richard Mentor Johnson um, never married a white woman. He uh, had a long-term relationship with an enslaved African-American woman named Julia Chin. Um, and besides the, the building that I showed you previously, the only other surviving building on the Choctaw Academy grounds today is this stone house. Um, and this may have been where Julia Chen lived because it is something that um, Richard Mentor Johnson mentions uh, in his letters. Um, it's some kind of an outbuilding and it may have been where she lived. We, we don't have any credibly sourced pictures of Julia Chen. Um, we do have that picture of her daughter, Imogene. Um, in terms of the relationship between the two, we have a lot more from Richard's perspective. Um, so Julia Chen had actually previously um, been owned by Richard's parents. And um, when Richard moved out of the house and became a bachelor, Julia went with him and was his housekeeper. Um, when Richard was in his early 30s and Julia was about 20 years old, they started to have children. They had two children together um, and Julia remained with him throughout the rest of her life. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the, we can, what kinds of information we can get out of the records. And this is where I'm gonna be really drawing from the Filson's collections to help us understand this. So Richard, um, he does talk about Julia Chen with some frequency. And one of the things that makes him kind of exceptional in antebellum history is that he was um, fairly open about his interracial family. Um, the person that he was most often compared to uh, both then and now is Thomas Jefferson, um, because of course, Thomas Jefferson had a long-term relationship with an enslaved woman named Sally Hemings and also had um, children with her. But Thomas Jefferson never talked this openly about um, his uh, black children um, and enslaved um, partner in the way that Richard Mentor Johnson did. So like the, the farthest that he goes um, is there's actually one letter in the Filson written in 1840 where he calls Julia my bride. Um, and both from the Johnson side of the family and the side of the family that descended from the Chens, um, they both have oral traditions that claim that Richard and Julia were married actually by Thomas Henderson. Um, 
Now we don't, that was illegal in antebellum Kentucky. They may have had some kind of ceremony. We don't really know. But what we can see is that Richard certainly thinks of Julia as his uh, partner and what we would now call a concubine or a kind of substitute wife. Um, now, the really sad thing about the records when it comes to this is that we don't really have Julia's perspective on her involvement with the relationship. And we have to remember that like the reality of this is that Julia really did not have the power to say yes or no to a sexual relationship with Richard Mentor Johnson. Um, you know, she was his slave, she was technically his property. Um, and so she would have had very little power to resist his sexual advances. Um, we do know that she was literate. Um, the family oral history says that uh, Richard's mother, Jemima, taught Julia how to read and write, and Richard's letters do bear that out. Now, also from family history, um, family history suggests that Richard's brothers destroyed all of Julia's correspondence after her, after Richard's death, because they were trying to disinherit Richard's black daughters from um, inheriting his property. And, and this is kind of the smoking gun in the Filson's collections. Um, Richard will quote from Julia's letters uh, when he's writing to Thomas Henderson. So the reality of the relationship between the two is that Richard is a politician for his entire adult life. He is away in Washington for at least six months out of every year. Um, and so Julia, he counts on as a kind of surrogate and helpmate to run the plantation, to run aspects of the school. And so she is writing to him um, about what is happening back in Kentucky. So here's some excerpts from her letters where we can see what she's up to. So this is, this is Richard quoting, Julia in her letter of the 14th complains of Daniel and Jerry, who are two other enslaved men on the plantation. Um, and part of what she's talking about here is that she is having trouble controlling um, enslaved people, especially the men when Richard is gone. So she's, she's telling him about who is kind of um, uh, shirking work duties around the plantation. Um, she is also, uh, we can see from the second quote that she's making a list of who she's having difficulty with. Um, and she's going to pass that along through Thomas Henderson to try to help her solve this managerial and oversight problem. Um, you, there are a lot of interesting letters. Here's another one that, that kind of show you the amount of trust and authority that Richard vested in Julia. Um, she, you know, he's saying here that um, she, he's counting on her to make everybody on the plantation do their duty. Um, and, and also to Henderson, she's saying, he says um, that Julia only needs your assistance um, uh, to, to kind of enforce the rules. And he's saying that like, she is this kind of surrogate that people should behave with quote, the same propriety as if I were at home. Um, and this one, another really interesting one, he's saying you have to support Julia and her helpers, uh, support her authority. Um, and what he's talking about there are Julia and her mostly female um, family members. So she had uh, sisters and nieces and nephews who also lived at Great Crossings. And that's mostly who she relies on um, to get a lot of the work done. Um, and, you know, if she had any kind of agency in her relationship with Richard Mentor Johnson, it's clear that part of what she's doing here is to try to make a better life um, for her family and especially for her children. Um, so what we do know, I mean, Richard never eman emancipated Julia. She remained enslaved until she died. Um, but he did emancipate their two daughters and he gave them property 
um, when they married. Uh, they both married white men, um, probably with Richard's encouragement. Um, and they also received an education. And part of the reason that Richard is interested in, in hosting Choctaw Academy on his property is because he pays Henderson uh, extra money that he's actually skimming off of Indian Nation's tuition money um, to teach his daughters and some of their um, cousins at night and on the weekends. So, so his Richard's daughters with Julia were educated um, when they finally were emancipated, um, they could uh, manage property, they were literate, um, they had a pretty high skill set in terms of uh, their education level. Um, the other thing that we know about Julia Chen is that she is basically the plantation doctor. So um, she deals with both, you know, everybody really on the plantation, white, black, and Indian. Um, and she sadly died in the cholera epidemic in 1833 because she was taking care of so many people. Um, I th one thing that I thought was really interesting was just how open um, Richard Mentor Johnson was about his family. Um, I found it to be somewhat surprising. Uh, it did not really become an, a, a widespread political issue until Richard Mentor Johnson ran for vice president. So when he was just running for the House um, or Senate seats within Kentucky, occasionally his family would be mentioned, but it doesn't really become an explosive issue um, until 1836 when he is actively you know, campaigning for vice president. And you can see there, I mean, there are lots of newspaper articles that kind of lampoon his family. Um, something, I mean, Richard gives, well, I think if we, if we dig into the history of this family, there, there are a few things that we could say about why Kentuckians continued to vote for Richard Mentor Johnson, um, even though his um, interracial family was pretty well known um, especially in the bluegrass region. Um, one is that um, Richard believed, and, and it's probably true, that Kentuckians had more relaxed attitudes about race than people from Virginia, for example. So Kentucky then was the West. It was, it was less formal. People from different classes um, socialized more and, again, had somewhat more relaxed attitudes when it came to race. So for example, um, educating enslaved people was never outlawed in Kentucky like it was in many other Southern states. Um, Richard Mentor Johnson was also, he came from one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in Kentucky. And I, I think that he thought he was exceptional and that he could continue to behave in the way that he had always behaved. Um, and again, it doesn't really catch up with them until um, the late 1830s. Um, I, I wanna wrap up here, but I do wanna say like, we know quite a bit more about Johnson's relationship with his two daughters than we do about his relationship with Julia. Um, and again, he did emancipate them, he acknowledged them. This is a, another really um, interesting letter from the Louisville Advertiser about um, the death of Adeline, his younger daughter. Um, Imogene lived for a really long time and had many descendants and um, certainly benefited from the property that she inherited from her father, um, even though some of her white uncles ultimately took away some of the proper, some of the additional property that Richard tried to leave in the will. Um, so just wrapping up, um, I, I want to thank all of the institutions that have helped me research this book. And the big picture that I wanted to bring out today was just to show us some of the surprising insights that I think the Filson's collections can offer to us about Native American history in Kentucky and the history of race in Kentucky. And at this point, I want to turn it back over to Patrick.
Well, thank you so much. That was that was really enlightening and fantastic. And I, I, I really do appreciate a talk that that has a, a hard look at archives and, and what we do at the Pilsen and how that translates into scholarship. So uh, I know we've got a lot of great questions in here. Um, if anyone in our audience does have any more questions, they can drop them in the chat as we go. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. I'll also point out that there is a donation link um, in that chat as well. Um, we had a really great question about your point about Choctaw Academy being nominally voluntary. Um, and the, the uh, audience member asked how that compares with Carlisle and other mission schools in terms of required elements of acculturation. Um, and do you know of any other schools uh, in the 19th century with this nominally voluntary model of, of education? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, so this is a really unique school and it's, it's a model that the US actually moves away from because the issue with um, India, Indian nations paid for almost everything to do with this school. So they pay their tuition money, um, which they took out of their national coffers paid for about 90% of the school. Um, federal money only paid for about 10%. But what happened with that is that if Indian nations had the power of the purse, that also gave them power to dictate things like what subjects were taught at the school. Or if they didn't like what was happening with their children, they could go and um, yank them out of school. You know, so so what the federal government decided was that that gave Native nations too much power, um, and that's why they moved away from that model later in the 19th century when they decided to establish Carlisle um, and the the kind of national boarding school system model. So I would say that um, in this period. Um, it's, it's nominally voluntary because it's not really the students typically who are, who are volunteering to go. It's usually their parents or their tribal leaders. So definitely not every student was thrilled about coming here. Um, and as the school deteriorated after removal, some of the nations claimed that um, U.S. Indian agents were, were kind of forcing children into the school. Um, but again, because they had the power of the purse, they just said, we're not going to pay for this anymore. Um, and we're going to take our, our children back and, uh, and establish our own schools. Um, so yeah, it really is kind of unique in that way. And the federal government ultimately decided that it gave Native people too much power. We had a really fantastic question that I thought dovetailed nicely with your point about our perhaps uh, underappreciation of the frequency of, of Indian students at, uh, at colleges in this antebellum era with talking about transient had never recorded race. So we might not have known um, that these people um, were attending. And we had a question pivoting to the other point of the, the talk about interracial marriage. What can we learn um, through this, this unique window of Richard Mentor Johnson about perhaps the prevalence of interracial marriage that might not have been captured because they were illegal and we don't have that documentation elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's clear is that interracial relationships were very common in the 19th century. Um, and, and again, they, they tend to be underdocumented and these relationships really ran the gamut from clear instances of sexual violence um, to more consensual relationships. Like, for example, um, interracial marriage was legal for a long time in um, North Carolina until the 1830s. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think that there are all kinds of ways in which American families have always been really diverse. Um, the only thing that's really exceptional, I guess there are two things that are exceptional about um, the Johnson Chen family. Um, one is just that Richard Mentor Johnson was really famous and a lot of people who were involved in interracial marriages were working class. Um, so they just don't have as many documents recorded about them in general. Um, but among more elite people like Johnson, um, most of them, you know, many of them had interracial relationships and uh, just did not acknowledge wives or you know, th their partners, their concubines, or their children. So he is actually particularly noteworthy for emancipating his children. And, and I think that more than anything else was what was a political liability for him. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it just shows that this is 
underappreciated that it happened quite commonly, you know, and it's just finding it in the records that that can be difficult. But a question about the, the sort of extended Johnson family and Richard's place within it, their perception of him. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, not only of, of the interracial relationship, but then also this, uh, this relationship with the Choctaw, because of course, uh, Johnson family fortunes improved mightily after Indian removal, don't they? Yeah, so I mean, the whole extended Johnson family is really interesting. And um, one of the things that I did as part of this project was to talk to descendants of both the, um, the white side of the Johnson family and the intermarried black side of the Johnson family. Um, uh, so just uh, first of all, the part of the reason that Johnson got involved in this whole enterprise in the first place is that his sister Sally married William Ward, who was the federal agent to the Choctaws. Um, so he already had this kind of closeness that was related to a family um, relationship. Um, one of the reasons why it was useful for me to do oral histories with some family members was, um, again, that, that this was kind of a taboo subject, uh, this idea of interracial relationships. And so some things are only documented or suggested through oral history. Um, so there is oral history that suggested that Richard's mother was really against um, him having a child with Julia or acknowledging children with Julia. Um, but uh, if you look, for example, at, um, and you know, after his death, I mentioned that two of his brothers, purpose, they contest the will um, of Johnson. And so they are able to actually, um, basically Imogene and her family can only keep the property that they gained while Richard was alive and Richard's brothers, two of them, Henry and um, one of the other brothers, they get the rest of the property because of course, um, Richard was never legally married to Julia. And so Imogene is considered an illegitimate child. Um, but on the other hand, there are Johnson family members, white, white Johnsons who continue to trade um, with Imogene and her family who um, have at least like economic relationships with them. So anyway, like within the Johnson family, there's certainly resistance to um, the relationship with Julia Chen and um, Johnson's acknowledgement of the family, but not everyone agrees. You know, there's, there, there are informal or perhaps more close ties that continue to um, connect the two sides of the family. Got another really fantastic question about the graduates of Choctaw Academy. Do a lot of them, uh, or do some of them stay in and around Kentucky or do they primarily go back um, to their nations and follow their fortunes wherever they go? They almost all go back to Indian territory. Um, I mean, I think that there are very, very few of them that I've been able to find who stayed in, in anywhere in the East. Um, there are some folks who, like I suggested, continued to do advanced study in Kentucky. So some doctors, some lawyers, some ministers, actually. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that American attitudes toward race are becoming more rigid um, between Indian removal and the Civil War. And so they're encountering a lot of racism. That's very clear. But I think the other thing is that there's a pull factor um, that they wanna be close to their families in Indian territory. Um, many of them also write that they feel a kind of obligation since their nations have spent so much money educating them um, that they want to go back and give back to their communities. So I would say like that is one of the number one thing that you see from, from graduates is either a desire to return to family or this, this feeling that they have something to contribute. Um, and many of them do become um, politicians or teachers or doctors, you know, within their home nations. And so I would say that, you know, of the people I've been able to trace, probably about 95% of them go back to their um, homes. That, uh, that sounds like strange echoes of the land-grant college system that will come into, into being a few decades later. 
Um, we I had a question wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the preservation work that's going on at Choctaw Academy now. Sure. Um, so I mentioned before that there are really two buildings, um, only one of which relates to the academy that have survived. Um, so these are owned by an ophthalmologist, uh, Chip Richardson. And if you guys are interested in learning more, he has a Facebook page called Save the Choctaw Academy. Um, he, Dr. Richardson has been this great um, networker who has, you know, worked with me, um, worked with um, the Choctaw Nation um, and some other partners um, within Kentucky to try to raise money. I mean, this is going to be a project that's going to require a huge <laughs> undertaking, but it's an incredible piece of Kentucky history. Um, so it's a three-story building. Uh, the roof did collapse. Um, several years ago. So that's why they built that kind of superstructure on top of it. Um, but like, I think it could be a great interpretive site one day. Um, the Kentucky Historical Society has many pieces from the Johnson family. Also descendants of uh, Richard and Julia have kept a lot of material culture from the academy. So I can imagine it one day being this kind of interpretive place where um, Kentuckians, uh, visitors, school kids could go and learn more about this history. And um, like I said, Choctaw Nation is involved. Um, right now, um, there's a documentary that's being produced about it. So I would say if you're interested, definitely keep your eyes peeled for the documentary and visit that Save the Choctaw Academy Facebook page. It's a wonderful uh, idea to be able to think about interpreting very broadly this, this fluidity and rigidity of race um, over time in the antebellum era when we tend to think of it as so fixed. Um, final question, because we're running out of time here from Facebook, wondering if you could talk about your next project uh, on slavery after the Civil War. What sort of archival collections are you looking at for that? And, and how does your interpretive lens, um, you know, is that similar or different than this project? Yeah, so my new book project is, um, I, I, I would say that my broad historical interests are um, colonialism and slavery and, and the Civil War era kind of brings those together. What I'm mostly looking at here is how Americans thought about slavery and freedom in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, it does kind of relate to this project in the sense that um, the Civil War was not, I mean, um, the Civil War didn't end slavery in Indian territory. Um, it was actually only through uh, the Treaty of 1866 that the U.S. tried to implement abolition there. Um, and that was a kind of precursor to what happened broadly in the West. There were different forms of slavery, not all of which looked like what was happening to the East. Um, but the U.S. kind of extended this policy of abolition and embraced this, this image of itself as a liberator um, and civilizer. Um, even though that process really happened unevenly in the West and it took a long period of time. Um, so I kind of, I look at different forms of unfree labor. Um, I look at slavery in Indian territory. Um, I look at the abduction of orphans. Um, I look at peonage in California. Um, and I also look at carceral labor, which of course happened across the US and was of course protected by the 13th amendment. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of extending some of the same themes um, from this book and, and looking more at um, how uh, colonialism and slavery intersected in the West and um, how Americans thought about those really complicated questions after the Civil War. Well, that sounds like that dovetails perfectly with our, uh, our uh, Elena Roberts lecture coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so we'll implore our audience to sign up for that and hope to have you back to talk about that new project when it's finished. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for your attention and, and your questions, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Christina Snyder. We've really appreciated it. Thanks to everyone who joined us for lunchtime. I guess everybody back to work now. <laughs>